Uh, today we're going to look at how did we get the Old Testament, which is a relevant and important question. Uh, maybe not for some of us here. Uh, we just say, oh, we just believe it's the Word of God, and we just carry on, and life is simple. Uh, but there are people out there who really want to know. They want to know how did we get the Bible. And so today we'll look at how did we get the Old Testament. And uh, in two weeks' time, we'll meet again. We'll have a look and see how we got the New <coughs> Testament. So let's turn our Bibles to 2 Peter 1.20. 2 Peter 1.20-21, to 21, the Bible says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the, will, in the human will, but prophets, through, uh, prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So before we get into how we got the Old Testament, it's so important to remember that, uh, that God is the author of the Bible. The discussion question, how, did, how do you imagine the Old Testament was written? Fun uh, exercise in imagination. How do we? How do you imagine this? Uh, if if you said you know they had a, a laptop and, and, and a printer, uh, <laughs> you know, your imagination is very rich. <laughs> uh, I think it's just safe to say that this is a very complex issue uh, and topic. Uh, is no, I can do justice in thirty minutes. Not to mention, I'm not an expert in how the Old Testament was written. Um, I appreciate about this topic. It gets me excited about the Bible. Hopefully it gets you excited. Uh, it's, 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 it's not dry. It's not boring. Uh, it's, you know, again, you're, you're using all our, all our senses to actually um, uh, dig into the Bible, including our imagination. You know, as you open up, uh, for example, Exodus, you know, have a, just think about it and put yourself in that time and space and, what must have it been like, and so on. I mean, it's a very, the Bible is beautiful. It's brilliant. It's rich. And so a question like this is not just academic. Uh, it can actually really inspire our Bible study, and that's the hope that um, this lesson does, is it inspires us more to go into our Bibles, dig into it, and uh, it's, it's really an incredible, beautiful uh, book. What we're going to focus on now is uh, the Hebrew canon which we call the Old Testament. Now, it's identical in terms of content, but it's different in, in the way it's arranged and the number of books they have. The Hebrew canon can be divided into three parts. The first five books is called the Torah, which is the same as our first five books, the same order. And then they have something called the Prophets. Uh, it's called, the, and I'm going to butcher the... Trans, uh, the pronunciation of this, I'm, I'm not, I don't know Hebrew. It's uh, Nebium. Uh, I'm, I'm saying it wrong and I know it. So I apologize. Uh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's just the way I can't pronounce it really well. But it's called Prophets. And as are the Prophets. And if you look closely, uh, you have Joshua, Judges, Samuel. You have Kings. So they, didn't have, they don't have First Kings, Second Kings like we do. The Christian Bible does. They just call them kings. It's one whole thing. It's kings. And then you have the writings, the Ketuvim. That's what they called it. Again, forgive me for, for the pronunciation. Uh, and that's the Psalms, the Proverbs. And the last book, as you see here, the last book is Chronicles. What's the last book of our Old Testament Bible? Malachi, right? The Hebrew canon, the last book is Chronicles. And we'll see the significance of it at the end of this lesson. So first off, these are not just arbitrary lists of books. Just to take us back in time. Uh, it's not the fact that there are a bunch of people sitting around like a room like this, and they just sort of pondered what should be in the Bible. Well, we should come up with something called the Bible. Now, what would you put in it? And then, you know, someone says, let's put this in. Someone says, let's put that in. And then just arbitrary, they're just a list of books that were just sort of put together. And there you, there you have it. That's how we have the Hebrew canon. That wasn't it at all. Uh, the canon grew gradually over time. Um, and here's, uh, here's something that uh, Andreas Kostenberger, one of the scholars, uh, he says, when individual writings were completed, they were often immediately recognized and accepted as divinely authoritative. 
So as it was being written, people saw it. And so let's look at a few scriptures that, um, that, that tells us this. Uh, Exodus 24, verse 3 and 4. Uh, the Bible says, When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He said it, he wrote it down, it's authoritative. Uh, let's look at Exodus 24 verse 7. Uh, it says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. So it's almost real time. Uh, God said it. It's written down. It's the word of God. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 verse 1 and 2. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land the Lord, the God of our ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord, your God, that I give you. So again, it's, it's, it's a gradual um, movement towards the canon. But as they were being written, they became authoritative. Does that make sense? Uh, the other thing that's so important, and we'll spend most of the time discussing this, the Hebrew Bible is not just individual verses or books in isolation. Instead, they collectively tell a story. So the Hebrew Bible or our Old Testament, it's the same thing, just ordered differently. Uh, they're telling a narrative, a story. And that's so important when we discuss how we got the Old Testament. Uh, and if a friend of yours asks, or you ask, because this is a great opportunity to have some good discussion. Because they're people who are interested. Uh, it's probably one of the most common questions I pose to campus students when I go reaching out. Hey, how do you know the Bible is reliable or, or how do you get the Bible how do you think we got the Bible or you know what do you think um, wh how do you know that uh, that in the transmission of the Bible from the original to today that uh, the message hasn't been lost or corrupted common questions right your colleagues asking this your classmates asking this your neighbors your friends it's just they're not raising their hands and asking <laughs> they're thinking so you can give them the permission. You can, you can ask for them. Say, hey, you know, we went to church and midweek we had this lesson. How do you think we got the Bible? And, and find out what they think. Um, because uh, it, it's a common question. And when you answer the question, it's important to, to draw people back to the narrative. And so what we're going to do now is just trace through the narrative of the Old Testament. So let's start in Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. Um, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So this is where it begins. God created humanity to be in his own image. He had a job for us to do, to be his image bearers. It's deeply relational. Uh, he wanted us to represent him, uh, be, a, be his steward. Uh, and take care of his creation, and then sum up the praises of creation back to him. Unfortunately, we did not want that. We, didn't, we weren't satisfied with being image bearers of God. We wanted to actually be him. And so you can read through Genesis 3 and the fall narrative. And in Genesis 3.23, God banishes or exiles Adam and Eve from the garden to work the ground from which he have been taken. Again, it's a prominent theme across the Bible is this notion of exile uh, and restoration. So God banishes his image bearers because his image bearers banish him. In effect, we don't want you, God, get out. And we can see that still played out to this day. We want to kick God out of everything. Uh, and that's, so God exiles or banishes. And then the story gets goes from bad to worse. If you can read through Genesis 1 to 11, it's, it's called Genesis for a reason, it's, and it's, it's foundational to the rest of the Bible. Uh, so in Genesis 12, God then calls a man called Abram. He says, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will, sh I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So God takes this man, Abram, and says, through you will come a nation, a people, through whom the rest of the world will be blessed. And if you fast forward um, to Exodus and God's people, Abraham's people, they are now slaves in Egypt. And then God has to perform mighty acts of rescue to rescue his people. And in Exodus 19, uh, this is what God tells his people. He says, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. All the whole, although the whole earth is mine, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So again, this is the formation of a people of God who will then be the instrument of God to rescue the rest of the world. That's what the vocation of, uh, of, of royal priesthood really is. Kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? A priest goes and reconciles God to um, humanity, humanity to God. Does that make sense? And so the narrative continues. Um, you have... And, and if you read through Exodus, you know the story, uh, the first five books, you know the story. Instead of going into the promised land, the, the, they rebelled and a generation was lost. And then eventually they get into the promised land. Uh, and then you have the book of Judges, which is just a, 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 a sad and depressing pattern of disobedience, uh, punishment, uh, grace of God, uh, rescue. Disobedience, punishment, grace of God, rescue. And it's that pattern that continues. And if you fast forward to 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. And, in, uh, and the Lord told Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king. Because that's, remember, that's the paradigm. God is king. God creates his people to be his representatives, his ambassadors. But that's not what we want. We want to be king. And so God takes Abraham, calls the people, uh, the, the biblical Israel, to, to be the people through whom God will rescue humanity. The very nation through whom God was going to bring uh, redemption to the world is now saying, God, get out. We want a king. Just like every other nation, we want to be like everyone else. So again, fast forwarding, the, there's severe consequences of the biblical nation of Israel rejecting God. Uh, in, 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 in 1 Kings, you'll find that the kingdom has split. So God gives them kings, uh, Saul being one, uh, David being the, the next king in line. And then Solomon, probably the king who, at, uh, in his reign, uh, Israel was at its pinnacle and, 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 and of power and, uh, and affluence and all of it. It was, it was the height of their kingdom. And then it just crumbles and crashes. The kingdom splits into northern kingdom, southern kingdom. And you can read that in 1 Kings 12. Uh, what's the consequence of disobedience? Exile. And so that's what happens to God's people. They go into exile. First the northern kingdom. Uh, and you can read that in 2 Kings 15, 29. And then the southern kingdom. And uh, when the, in, in 586 BC, the southern kingdom, um, Babylon comes, takes them to exile, and destroys the temple. Now the temple was essential for, for, the, for God's people, because that's where God resides with his people. But the fact the temple fell says that God has left. And the temple has fallen and God's people are now again in exile. And so that's the narrative of the, biblical, of the Hebrew canon. Uh, let me just go into the prophets for a minute. Uh, so again, the, the prophets, they generally did three things. Uh, covenant warnings. So they'd warn God's people to not... Break the covenant. In Shev, the covenant repentance. The prophets are telling God's people, repent, turn, or else. And we'll look at that in just a minute. And then there's this incredible hope 
beyond judgment. There is hope. Hope of restoration. Even when it's at its worst, there is hope and restoration. So let's look at a few examples. Just two. One is in Amos. Amos chapter 5 verse 27. So Amos, uh, quick background. He, he was from the southern kingdom. But he was commissioned by God to go and preach to the northern kingdom. And this is the message he gives them. He says, therefore I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. Says the Lord whose name is God Almighty. So that's Amos' job. To go into the northern kingdom and tell them, your time's up. And, um, and, and I would say probably about, about 30 odd years after this proclamation, they go into exile, 722 BC. So that's pretty scary. Now let's look at Jeremiah 29. So let's start reading from verse 1, okay? Jeremiah 29, verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the, people, that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the sur surviving elders among the exiles. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. So it's to the exiles and to the priests, the prophets and all other people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So where are these people now that's receiving this letter? Babylon. In Babylon. They are in exile. Uh, so verse 2. Um, this was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials and the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to uh, Elasa, son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, uh, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to you. Those ca I carry in an exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Okay? Marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the prosperity, peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and divine, diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Verse 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. <laughs> plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Does that make sense? So, I hope no one in this room from now on out, we'll pull out verse 11 all by itself and says, God has great plans for me. He's going to prosper me. Please. Please. So, makes sense, right? See, this is why we need to know our Hebrew Bible. Why the Old Testament or Hebrew canon or the Old Testament. So we don't take passages out of context and, do, and, 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 and make a mess of things. So... As we saw earlier, the Hebrew canon is divided into the, the law, the first five books, the prophets, and um, the writings, ending with chronicles. So our Bible, our Old Testament, ends in Malachi. Again, same content. Content hasn't changed. The order of books has changed. So let me just end here, because chronicles, uh, let's look at chronicles, the last book of their Bible, the last chapter and the last verse of that book. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. That same temple that was destroyed by Babylon in 586 BC. So this is about rebuilding the temple. And uh, any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord their God 
be with them. So did you pick up on how the, the book, the, how the, the Hebrew canon is arranged? You, you go from Genesis to Chronicles, ending with, we're going to go back home. Okay, now, how does the book of Malachi end? Does anybody remember Malachi, how it ends? So Malachi is written post-exilic uh, return, meaning it, after the exile, they come back now. Now they're in, at, at their home, and Malachi basically is a stinging rebuke that even though they're back from exile, the very exile they experienced because of disobedience has not changed their heart. They're still far from the Lord. And it ends with, the day of the Lord is coming, but who can stand? So it's a both warning and encouragement uh, that the Lord is coming. Uh, some are going to be happy and some are not. He's a refiner's fire. So Malachi ends in that manner. Chronicles ends with them coming back and about to rebuild the temple. And I think that's very intentional arrangement of the Hebrew canon. Because what they're saying is that exile is over in one sense. We return from Babylon to our homeland, but exile is still not over yet. We're still in exile. We're back home, but we're still in exile from the Lord. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so again, just to recap the Hebrew canon, or the Old Testament as we call it. Again, the canon is telling us a story, a narrative of God creating us in His image we rejecting God, um, and then we go into exile. Humanity is in exile. God picks one man, Abram, and he says, Through you will come a nation through whom I will bring the whole of creation back to me. Again, they return from exile. The people of God uh, through whom the world uh, will be blessed, um, they themselves are now um, in trouble. They themselves are, are, are failing in their vocation to be the people through whom God will rescue and, and, and redeem his entire creation. And, we, and, and, and so we end in Chronicles with, this, with the last verse being returning from exile, about to build a temple, even though they're back from exile, and you have other post exilic books like Malachi, so they, it wasn't like they didn't know they were back from exile, but they're saying we're still in exile somehow, some way. And what is the next step? And that is the to be continued, dot, dot, dot. And so next time we meet, we're going to pick up on the dot, dot, dot. We're going to look at how the New Testament is put together. Because the New Testament authors, Jesus knew this narrative very well. And, and we have to plug them into this narrative to make sense of what they did, why they did, what, what specifically Jesus did, and how in Him we are back from exile. And we can have a genuine relationship with God. And we are the people of God through whom God wants to now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything. Do you see how it all just interconnects? And so... That's the, that's the lesson for today. Uh, next, week, next time we'll meet uh, March 25th. Uh, how did we get the New Testament?